But my name is Ben, um, and I'm a lead pastor down at the bridge in Lettington, Missouri, if we haven't met before. And I have four kids, four daughters. We were going to bring them up here tonight, but we thought they were going to have school tomorrow. We've been on Christmas break since, you know, way before Christmas. They had didn't have school today. We thought, well, for sure, have school tomorrow. I'm going to keep them at home. That way they can go to bed and actually get up on time for school. They already canceled school down our way, so... So they could have came with, but they stayed back. And I've been on a vacation. I went on vacation Christmas Day and just got back. And so, you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've done nothing but uh, eat uh, junk food. So I'm in a sugar coma and play little girl um, play dates uh, and games. And so I'm hoping that tonight goes a little bit better uh, than Mariah Carey's performance on the New Year's Rockin' Eve. Did you guys watch that? Um, but that was something. It was something, wasn't it? First she forgot her pants, and then she forgot her words. It was a tough night, tough night for her, tough night for a lot of people. It reminded me a lot of uh, Redneck uh, Karaoke Tuesday down where I live in the sticks um, back there. But in all seriousness, in 2016, you might have, um, it might have ended rough for you. Your year might have ended rough, hopefully not as rough as hers, um, but it might have ended rough, might have been routine, but there's new grace, there's new mercy for you uh, and for all of us in 2017. And I'm excited to be here tonight and to kick off 2017 with you guys. was excited when Tim asked me to come up and preach, and I'm stoked to preach the Word of God to you guys tonight. Um, the corporate reading, reflecting, uh, proclaiming, responding to God's Word is very important in a believer's life. Um, since the beginning of Christendom and Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, Christians have been changed and forever changed by the preaching and the proclamation of God's Word. And so I have a feeling that tonight as we open up God's Word and we hear from it and we read from it, that tonight people will be changed as well, and that the Spirit will stir people's hearts if we receive God's Word. All right. Perfect. The question is, though, will we receive it? And it's a silly question to ask, isn't it? You would think that the pure, perfect, um, holy, life-transforming Word of God would be received, but often instead of receiving it, we Instagram it and we move past it instead of allowing it to change and to transform our lives. And so tonight we don't want to do that. We don't want to settle for the crumbs of the world. We want to feast on the juicy steak of God's Word. And so if you have a Bible, open up to Acts chapter 1 is where I'm going to begin. If you don't have a Bible, you can flip on your phone or your tablet device, uh, the Bible app on your phone, and go there with me. It should be on the screen as well. Uh, but we want to hear from God's Word. I'm going to pray one more time. And then we're going to hear from Acts chapter 1. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today, the chance to be with friends and family here at City on a Hill. I thank you for this blessing that we get to come together as Christians and to worship you and to hear from your word and to proclaim your word, the truths about Jesus, the truths about us, the truths about your mission and what you have for us. And so I pray right now as we sing that song about the Holy Spirit being welcome here, I pray right now that the Holy Spirit, you, Holy Spirit, we invite you to to change our minds, to work in our hearts, to stir our affections, to mold us. I pray two things specifically tonight. I pray first that if there is a man or a woman in this room who does not know you, that Holy Spirit, you would grant them repentance and that you would uh, lead them today to respond to you. And number two, for the believers in this room, that you would encourage them in their faith, you would strengthen them from your word, and that we would see there is new mercy and grace for us in 2017, and uh, show us what you have for us this year. It's in Christ's name we pray and the people said amen. amen acts chapter one in the first book o theophilus i have dealt with all that jesus began to do and to teach until the day when he was taken up and had given commands through the what's the word holy spirit to the apostles whom he christ had chosen he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So then... When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But, verse 8, here's our key verse. You will receive, what's the word? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was, whoop, he was gone. He was lifted up, there he went, 
And a cloud took him out of their sight. That's Jesus' ascension. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And so they're standing around looking. Jesus has said, the Spirit's going to come. You're going to have power to be witnesses here and to the ends of the earth. And they're, what do we do? What do we do? Waiting and looking. But I want you to notice that the first 11 verses of the book, book of Acts, Jesus is mentioned every single time. In every single verse, verse 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, every verse is about Jesus and every verse mentions Jesus because there is no Christianity without Jesus. It's about him. There's no Christianity without the Christ. There's, there's no reason for us to gather without the Christ. He also mentions something else. Luke does, who wrote this book, in verse 1. Um, did you catch what it was? he said that he wrote another book so Acts is the second book that he wrote he mentions O Theophilus I dealt with these things what Jesus began to do what Jesus began to teach in my first book it's how it starts off in Acts chapter 1 do you know what book he's talking about do you guys know what it is shout it out if you know it yeah that's right it's Luke so Luke is the prequel and Acts is the sequel in Luke we hear all about King Jesus it records Jesus's words and it records Jesus's works Dr. Luke does the gospel of Luke teaches us that at the center of this Christian faith that's all about Jesus is the living ruling reigning resurrected king of kings and lord of lords Jesus Christ it's his words and his works you can see his teachings and what he did in the gospel of Luke then in the book of Acts Luke goes on to record them the continuing work of Jesus and really what we see in the book of Acts is what Jesus is going to do to and what Jesus does through his church so Luke the prequel what Jesus did in his teaching Acts the sequel what Jesus is going to continue to do through his people and through the church and really to his people and verses 4 and 5 that we just read is where it gets really interesting to me Jesus orders his disciples to do something and so Jesus at this point he's already taught he's called disciples he's healed the sick he's he's beat back demons he's raised the dead and he himself has raised from the dead Jesus has gone to the cross he was crushed for our sins he was brutally murdered in our place he was put in the tomb and then he was raised to life again and they have recognized him so in Luke chapter 24 they've recognized Jesus on the road to Emmaus and they've seen he's alive I can't believe it he's he's alive He's the Messiah. He is God. He is Christ. But then in verses 4 and 5, Jesus gives him the weirdest first assignment I think he could possibly give at first look. He says, did you catch what it was? Assignment number one, do nothing and wait. Verses 4 and 5. Luke 24 ends that way. Stay in Jerusalem. Stay in the city until you receive power from on high. And so if you're following, if you're catching it, these are the only people who know at this point, and they've seen Jesus alive. They've seen his death, and they've seen him rise. He's appeared to them. There's a lot of people who don't know Jesus and don't know that message. So the few people that know that message, and there's a bunch of people that don't know that message, the only people that know the message, Jesus tells them to wait, to do nothing. First assignment. Here's your first assignment, disciples, after my resurrection. Do nothing. <laughs> wait. It seems anti a mission, right? It seems like, what, he should have told him, no, you go tell everybody. But he says, no, do nothing, wait. And I think the question should be asked, why? 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 Well, we're told in Acts chapter 1, they're to wait for the Holy Spirit. In fact, it says they're to wait for power, for ministry, from the Holy Spirit. If you see verse 8, once more, one more time, verse 8 said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. Uh, you're going to receive power. When does it happen? Verse 5 tells us it's going to happen when Jesus baptizes them with the Holy Spirit. They will receive the power that they need. And then there'll be witnesses here in Jerusalem, so locally, up the road, and to the ends of the earth. We need to embrace some tension, though, in the room as we move forward tonight. As I talk about the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer, and specifically the power of the Holy Spirit in your life for ministry, to be witnesses. Um, when I speak about the power of the Holy Spirit, and I get to do that a lot now, I like that, um, I realize that most of the time there's two different groups of people in the room. Uh, so group one, 
And the first group of people, typically, and sometimes there's three, there's people who didn't grow up in church at all and have no idea, but a lot of our context is people who have gone to church before. And group number one, uh, those who grew up in maybe a charismatic or a Pentecostal church. And in your church, if you grew up in a church like this, you probably talked more about the Holy Spirit than you did about anything else, maybe even more than the cross and the resurrection. You talked about the Holy Spirit a lot. Uh, your church might have um, stressed that you had to express certain revelatory gifts or you were a junior varsity Christian and you weren't a varsity Christian your church bus might have had flames on it anybody have that the flames on the bus or your pastor used to have the cares mullet and I used to call him yeah so there's a lot of us that grew up in those churches but then there's group number two and it's the other group of people the people who grew up Baptist or maybe mainline church and you probably talked more about the buffet line if we're being honest than you did about the Holy Spirit your church probably stressed the dangers and the errors of those in a charismatic church or in that tradition. You typically would like um, hymns and order or, and potlucks. You got to get that in there. So you got one that likes free flowing and doing anything and the other order hymns and, and potlucks, right? And so in all seriousness, I want to do a show of hands and you can, it's okay no matter where you grew up. I just want to see my context here tonight. If you grew up in a church that was Pentecostal or charismatic, raise your hand. Go ahead and raise both hands because you know you want to, right? Are you ready for that? All right. If you grew up in a church that was maybe Baptist or mainline or you grew up in no church at all um, and you didn't talk about, maybe you rarely talked about the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, raise your hand or more likely tip your cap, right? So, yeah, so about half and about half and half. Thank you for participating. And so I want to make an, give you an admission before we move forward. Uh, forward, and I have uh, two things to say before that too. Um, if you grew up afraid of allowing the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you must ask why. Why is that? Um, maybe you were afraid because you saw abuse of spiritual gifts, but abuse, if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, does not warrant neglect. If you read the book of Corinthians, the Corinthians were jacked up. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they were abusing spiritual gifts. But he tells them right at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 12 to not neglect the spiritual gifts, but instead to pursue them more. It's a really interesting passage. It says, I don't want you to be uninformed about them. And so instead of neglecting them, he talks more about them. You, ma you must ask why. If you saw abuse or you heard error, we still must talk about this. The Bible has a lot to say about the Holy Spirit. Specifically, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit is God. God it says that he's God. Acts chapter 5 makes it clear. The Holy Spirit is God. Should we be afraid of God? Should we be afraid of more God in our lives? I think the answer to that is no. God loves us. We want more God in our lives. Um, but at the same time, if you grew up in a church that was obsessed with the Holy Spirit, number two, uh, I want to ask you, what did that obsession lead you to do? Did, did that obsession lead you to love Jesus more and to minister to other people? To love and serve others well or did it sort of like just end on yourself where you're the awesome guy you're like I'm varsity Christian and these guys aren't did it move you to love Christ and to love others and to serve in ministry you see spiritual gifts according to scripture are not to primarily be spent on yourself they're dispensed and given for the good of the body and for the good of the church so that other people may know Christ to be to be used for ministry and tonight, in this example, in Acts chapter 1, we see that when the Holy Spirit came upon the early disciples, it was, in fact, to empower them for ministry. And so here's my admission. So those two questions for you. If you grew up in those two traditions, I want you to wrestle with that and think about that. But here's my admission to you. I am unashamedly a reformed, charismatic, and missional Christian. I did not grow up any of these things. I grew up in a, with a man-centered view of salvation rather than a God-centered one. I grew up believing that all the supernatural gifts of the Spirit had ceased, but now I embrace them. I grew up with a bomb shelter mentality that the world was bad, and as Christians we needed to huddle up and save ourselves, but now I believe God is reconciling all things to himself. He's restoring all things to himself, and we should participate in that reconciliation and that restoration. And you might ask why? I wrestled with this. I mean, I really wrestled with all the problems that I had with all of those things and read the word, and I received the word. I allowed, I allowed the word to stand over me rather than me standing over the word, and it challenged me. It really challenged my beliefs. It changed my thinkings, and it influenced me. And so 
Let's dig back in. Where should we start with our study of the Holy Spirit? Luke tells us in verse 1. He says, if you really want to know about the power of the Holy Spirit, you should start in his first book. He says, I've already written one book, O Theophilus. You know what that is. But if you want to really know about the Holy Spirit, we start in Luke, this power that he was talking about that comes. And what do we see repeatedly in the book of Luke? Now, I'm just going to give you a brief overview because we don't have time. I mean, I could preach for days, but you don't want that. Um, we don't have time to go see everything in Luke, but I just want to show you uh, a few truths in Luke and then and move back into Acts from there. But number one, and something that I think will be on the screen I want you to see is that Jesus lived his life by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what we see in the Gospel of Luke. Over and over again we see it. Jesus lived his life in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're reminded at Christmas time, you guys were just reminded that Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. We call that the incarnation. Tim Keller says that's the biggest doctrine, the most explosive doctrine of Christianity, uh, that God became man. Jesus is fully God and he's fully man. And so uh, he's full deity, but he's also fully man. He, had, he was born a baby. He had to grow up. He experienced temptation. He had to learn, Luke chapter 2 says. He grew in wisdom. So it's this tension. It's mind-boggling. It, it's like, how do we figure that out? It's hard to figure out, right? Philippians 2 tells us, in a great Christmas passage in Philippians 2, that God, even though he was in the, Jesus, even though he's in the form of God, equality with God, he limited his glory, he, he gave up his rights, he humbled himself, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross. It says, Jesus did that, became man, a servant, a suffering servant among us. Uh, and it shows us, so then if Jesus did that, if he laid aside his rights, like Philippians 2 says, how did he live his life? Luke shows us primarily he lived his life and he performed his ministry in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we see these pictures all the time of Jesus' deity, his godness, and also his humanity. Uh, there's a story in the Gospels about Jesus uh, sleeping on a boat. Do you remember that? There's a great storm going on, and he's just asleep because he needed rest. He was tired. We see his humanity asleep. But then he wakes up, and we see his deity, and he calms the winds and the waves and calms the storm. It's that tension that's there. He was fully God. We see his acts of deity at times. He forgives sins as only God could do. He calms the wind and the waves. But over and over again in Luke, if you read, when Jesus is in ministry, we see he does his ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit as he walks through this life. Luke 1 and 2 tells us that Jesus, the eternal God, was born and he lived by the power of the Spirit. It's where it starts. It says that um, what's conceived in, in Mary's womb is a miracle of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was a miracle of the Holy Spirit. So he's born and he lives his life by the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 3, if you want to write it down, verses 21 and 22 says that the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism. So Jesus, John the baptizer, is out baptizing people for uh, repentance and forgiveness, and, and then Jesus gets baptized, and when that happens, um, the Holy Spirit, it says, descends on him like a dove. There's that picture. And, and anoints him and descends on him and then the father speaks we see the whole of the trinity in the same passage there jesus the spirit the father speaks this is my son this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased before he launches into public ministry we we see that the spirit descend on jesus luke chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 says that jesus was full of and he was led by the holy spirit as he faced temptation Three temptations, Matthew 4, Luke 4. Jesus was led into the wilderness. He experiences temptation by Satan. He responds with the word of God. So a lot of times we say you need to know more of the Bible so you can beat temptation. But we miss the beginning where it says he was full of and he was led by the Holy Spirit as he encountered that temptation. Luke chapter 4 and verse 18 says that when his public ministry actually began and he preached a sermon, he read from Isaiah chapter 61, he said this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me and I'm here to preach good news to the poor and release the captors and, and that famous Isaiah passage, he starts with the spirit of the Lord is upon me. We are also told in Luke chapter 4, and this is just in one chapter if you want to read Luke 4, that Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
um, that people were amazed at his teaching because it was in the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, he casted out demons and he healed people because he was spirit-filled, it says, in Luke chapter 4. That's just Luke chapter 4, but we can keep going. Luke 10 says that Jesus was full of joy. He experienced joy through the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 12, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit will come and teach us. He's gonna, the Spirit will teach us, and Jesus is, is promising that to believers. Uh, Luke chapter 24, we're told that Jesus rose from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of Luke 24, he tells the disciples, wait, wait in Jerusalem, stay in the city until you receive power from on high. You'll be clothed with power, he says in Luke 24. Jesus lived his life by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Luke shows us that clearly if you go and read it, his ministry. Then the sequel in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we see more about the Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, the disciples, they're, they're doing that. They're waiting. They're asking questions like, what do we do? They're waiting, asking all these questions, but they're waiting for power from the Holy Spirit because Jesus told them to wait. Then if we read the verses uh, following, we know that Jesus, um, after Acts 1-8, Jesus ascended to the Father. So whoop, he's gone. <laughs> he ascends to the Father, and then he does, in Acts chapter 2, what is promised in John 14, 15, 16. He sends the Holy Spirit. He baptizes the believers. He sends the Holy Spirit. Jesus sent the Spirit to fill the disciples in Acts chapter 2, if you read it, and the church on that day explodes. And so the Holy Spirit falls. So after Jesus' life, after his death, after his resurrection, then he ascends to the Father, then he sends the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, um, they begin speaking, and then Peter stands up, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches a sermon. And on that day, the church goes from 120 people to 3,120 people in one day. That's what happened in God's power, not in their own power, when the Holy Spirit came and fell on them. And so we see um, something in the book of Acts, where in Luke we see that Jesus lived his life and his ministry by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, we see that Jesus continues. Jesus' disciples continue the spirit-filled ministry of Jesus. That's the book of Acts. Jesus lived his life um, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts, Jesus' disciples continue uh, to do Jesus' ministry uh, in the power of the Spirit, spirit-filled ministry. And so we see in Acts what Jesus does too, and through us, we continue the spirit-filled ministry of Jesus. But in Acts chapter one and verse eight, we gotta remember something. The mission that we're given is not about us. It's never about us. You'll be witnesses of Christ here, up the road to the ends of the earth. Witnesses of Jesus. The mission has never been about us. It's about Jesus and his people. It's about the Spirit working in and through us, and that's our only hope for really getting mission done. Um, we need more of the Spirit to get mission done and less of ourselves. We're really good at strategy. We're really good at planning. Um, Soma especially, man, this got so, many, so much tremendous teaching. You're getting ready to do the Merge series, so much tremendous teaching. I think we're really good at that, but, but we need the Spirit more than we need ourselves and our strategies and our plans to accomplish the big task of mission that Jesus has given us. And I often wonder if I do things and if we do things and if the church does things more in our own power than we do in the power of the Holy Spirit. Or are we better at creating strategy than relying and waiting on the Spirit? I want to encourage you tonight to yearn more for God. I want you to long to be filled with the Holy Spirit as you live lives on mission in 2017. I want you to have a spirit-empowered life. Now, thankfully, now we sit in the spot of redemptive history where Acts 2 has already happened. We sit in the spot in redemptive history where Jesus has already poured out the Holy Spirit on the church, and that is tremendous news for us. Um, now, I believe all Christians experience what we call spirit baptism at conversion, 
we see this taught as Paul instructed the Corinthian believers. And so um, the Corinthian church, if you read the New Testament, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then it continues on. Um, you got Acts and you got Romans. Eventually, Corinthians, the Corinthian church sits in the same sort of seed of redemptive history that we do. After the Holy Spirit was sent, and after Jesus sent the Spirit on the early disciples in Acts chapter 2. And Paul says this about our conversion in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. It says, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. And he's speaking about conversion, that when we become a part of the church, um, we drink of one spirit, we're baptized into this. And so from Corinthians, we see that our spot in redemptive history post-Pentecost Post Acts 2 is that spirit baptism or that metaphor that you hear people use is our reception of the Holy Spirit at the moment of our conversion to Jesus in faith and repentance. So when you believe the gospel of Christ and you're justified or made right for your sins, we are, as it were, according to 1 Corinthians 12, 3, deluged, engulfed um, by the Spirit of God. We are immersed and is saturated by the Holy Spirit. And so I believe spirit baptism is instantaneous. It's not a process. It's simultaneous with conversion. It's universal where all believers, those who repent and trust in Jesus, are recipients. It's unrepeatable, that, that act. And I believe it's permanent because Ephesians 1 tells us that you're sealed for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of God. So if that's true, and I think most of us in this room are believers, why don't we walk in the power of the Spirit? Very simply, we don't all live Spirit-filled lives. Um, we don't all um, walk in the Spirit. Spirit baptism and Spirit filling, I think, are two different things. Spirit baptism, conversion, permanent, instantaneous, forever, unrepeatable. Spirit filling, the scriptures talk about that as well. And it took me a long time to realize there was a difference, really, between spirit baptism and, and spirit filling. But now that I see it, it's, it's just amazing for me to think about and to talk about with people. You see, spirit filling is different than spirit baptism. Spirit filling can be quenched. Spirit filling can be neglected. Spirit filling can be missed as we worship ourselves rather than Christ. A spirit filling can be um, forfeited as we trust our own efforts more than God. So spirit filling as a metaphor, I believe, describes our continuous, ongoing experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives. To be filled with the Spirit is to come under more intense and intimate influence of the Spirit. Spirit filling can be forfeited and subsequently experienced again and again on multiple occasions throughout the course of the Christian life. And I think if you're not walking in power, it's because you're quenching the Spirit of God in your life. If you want to be powerful witnesses locally, up the road, and to the end of the earth, you need to walk in the Spirit. And so where in Scripture does it talk about Spirit filling? Well, lots of places. But one in particular I want to show you tonight. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. Ephesians 5, 18 says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with, uh, what's the word? So what is this filling? You can leave the verse up. Uh, this filling, it literally means to be permeated or to be intoxicated. Now, how many, that's a weird question, but how many, has anybody ever been drunk before? You know what it's like? You all lying, I know you're lying. All right, um, but Paul, right here in this verse, he compares and contrasts spirit filling with alcohol intoxication. Uh, he's comparing and contrasting, and he's showing us, don't, don't be drunk with wine, but instead be, be full of, be full of this permeated with, intoxicated with the Holy Spirit. So to be filled with the Spirit means, as we see that sort of illustration together, it means to come under the control of the Spirit. You know, if you drink too much alcohol, you come under the control of alcohol and you do stupid stuff and you all of that um, at the same time it means then to also be influenced by the spirit um, to be spirit filled when we are filled with the spirit it should be obvious to other people when somebody's drunk it's obvious I was on a plane ride uh, not too long ago I was going to speak 
at a conference in North Carolina, and I got stuck by this group of dudes on my plane ride that were going out to a, I think it was like a, I don't know, like a the, the guy's last hurrah type of thing. And it started before we got on the plane, and then they continued on the plane, and every single person on the plane knew what? They were drunk, right? Everybody could tell it, and the people had to come talk to them and all that stuff and the whole time and they're like so what do you do for a living I'm like well I'm a pastor and they're like oh blah, 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 and all of that um but when you're drunk it's obvious to others at the same time when we're filled with the spirit it should be obvious to others as we compare and contrast here is your life marked by by that do, do people know you you love the gospel you love Jesus can they tell your spirit filled and here also filling of the spirit is a command for every Christian every Christian. This is not about creating a two-tier system of Christianity. It's not about having junior varsity Christians and, and then the varsity team Christians. No, this, this command is present tense, and it's for all people. It's, he says, all believers, right here in Ephesians chapter 5, we want you to be filled with the Spirit of God. Um, and it's present tense, envisioning something, that this is a continuing ongoing experience that we have with the Lord to be spirit filled we see that in the book of Acts actually in the book of Acts we see the disciples filled with the spirit in Acts chapter 2 and then if you want to read in Acts chapter 4 it says they're filled again with the spirit baptized Acts chapter 2 filled with the spirit again Acts chapter 4 verse 31 they're they're undergoing persecution um, there's all kinds of stuff happening they decide to pray um, they pray not that God would deliver them from suffering. They, they don't pray that. They don't pray, God, make our persecutors stop. They don't pray, God, um, you know, help us not talk about you. They pray for boldness to proclaim the word. And, and they pray. And when they had prayed, and the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And it says they were all, what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. In the pattern of Acts, we see it over and over again. These guys filled with the Holy Spirit. Not one time, but over and over and over again. They needed multiple fillings. So if you're following, Tim gave me a hard topic tonight. I think there's one baptism at conversion of the Holy Spirit, but many fillings, many fillings. And we need to yearn for more of the Spirit of God. And then verses that follow that one in 518 begin to show us what it looks like if you are filled. So like, how do you know? Like, what does it look like if I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit? I'm walking in the Holy Spirit. Thankfully, right after that verse, there's more verses that talk about it. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. If you're filled with the Spirit, verse 19, you're addressing one another, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Number two, uh, next verse, uh, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another then, in the next verse, out of reverence for Christ. And so we see this, that if we're filled with the Spirit, a few things should be known for us. Number one is that we speak to one another in ministry. They addressed one another. You see, being filled with the Spirit is not to be spent on yourself, but to minister and to help other people. They address one another, singing psalms and hymns as well, um, but they're addressing, they're speaking the gospel to each other. Um, if you're walking in the power of the Spirit, you're sharing the good news of Christ. You're sharing about his life, death, burial, and resurrection. You're sharing with your friends about who Jesus is. You're speaking to one another in ministry, helping one another grow in their faith uh, if you're filled with the Spirit. We also see singing to God. It says they sang to God there in Ephesians 5.19, uh, making melody in their hearts, it said, to the Lord. And so men, I know most men don't like to sing unless they're like trying to get a girl and they learn how to play the guitar, right? But... But it says here that if we're spirit-filled, we, we make melody in our hearts to the Lord. We sing. We sing. And this isn't about singing greatly, all right? You don't have to sing very good, and that's not the point. In fact, in Psalms, it says make a joyful noise to the Lord. It can be a noise, all right? So it's not about singing pretty or, or being the best vocalist in the room, but it's about your heart connecting. Your heart connects with the words that Josh just sang. Spirit-filled, your heart's connecting, um, and you're getting excited on the inside about what we're singing about, about Jesus as we sing the gospel. 
It continued, and it said, giving thanks in, in all circumstances. And so it's gratitude then in your heart in all things. And, and you can only have gratitude in your heart for the Lord in the midst of suffering if you're spirit-filled. Romans chapter 8 says the spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we endure suffering. And, and how is that possible? How does that work together? Well, the Spirit is reminding us we are children of God. The Spirit is reminding us the gospel is true, that Jesus is king. And one day, everything that's sad is going to be made undone. His kingdom will one day just reign fully on the earth. It's going to happen. And, and gratitude in, in all things comes by the Spirit, applying that message of the gospel and the hope that we have to our hearts and to our minds even in the midst of suffering. And if that's you today, and you're in the midst of suffering, um, I just want to encourage you that you can have a great impact on your community. There's a girl in our church, lost her leg, she has cancer. And um, in, in the midst of that, her parents and her um, just spirit-filled witnesses to our community. There are more people meeting Jesus um, through her pain and through her testimony and through her response in the middle of that and her parents' response in the middle of that than any sermon I preach. Um, people see that. And so the, the Spirit even works good in all things through those terrible moments that we experience on this earth. And they know that one day everything will be made right. But then I said submitting to reverence, submitting to one another in reverence for Christ Spirit-filled lives should be, um, your relationships should be marked by this health. This idea that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you you're, and we're going to help each other. Uh, there's healthy relationships. And in fact, if the relationships aren't healthy, it's probably because you're not walking in the Spirit. You're filled with something else rather than being filled with the Spirit of God. So do those traits characterize you? If not, if not, you may have quenched the power of the Holy Spirit in your life for ministry and for your relationships. Are you walking in power? If not, maybe today you need to be filled with the Spirit. You need Him. So here is where the rubber meets the road, I think. Here is where we receive, we confirm, or we reject the Word of God tonight. Do we want to be Spirit-filled? Do we want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit for ministry and mission? Do we want to be anointed for ministry? Are we tired of doing things in our own power? Do we want to help others receive uh, more of Jesus and more of his word and more of his mission? Do we, do we want to be filled? Do we want all of our missional efforts to be empowered by God and not in our own strength? And I think we'd all say, yeah, right? Yes. So let me give you a few tips then then if that's true how do how do how do we be this spirit-filled believer and christian number one thirst after jesus thirst after jesus if you want to be spirit-filled we don't we're not just going to talk man spirit spirit no the more that we thirst after jesus it says the more we are spirit-filled it goes together thirsting after jesus jesus uh, speaks in john chapter 7 verses 37 through 39 on the last day of the feast the great day uh, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirst, let him come to me. Jesus, let, if, are you, come to me. Is anyone thirsty? Does anyone want more God? If anyone thirsty, come to me, Jesus says. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And then the next verse, he talks about what are those rivers? Now this he said about the Holy Spirit. This he said about the Holy Spirit. Those who believed in him, who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit had not yet been given, but we know now it has been. Acts 2, Jesus poured it out. The Spirit's been given. Jesus at that point had not been glorified. He had not died and rose and ascended. But he says, do you, do you want that? Do you want rivers of, of life flowing out of you? Do you want the Spirit flowing out of you? He says, come to me. Believe me. Believe me. I want to be spirit-filled, thirst after Jesus. More Jesus, more gospel, more of who he is, more truth. We used to sing this song, um, and if you grew up in the charismatic sort of tradition, you probably heard it. Um, it was, I got the river of life flowing out of me. Anybody ever hear that one? And spring up, oh well, in my soul. Spring up, oh well, and make me whole. 
I said, song, I was talking about this passage right here. I want rivers of life. I want my life to be characterized by addressing one another, speaking the gospel to one another, singing, making melody in my heart to the Lord where it connects and I'm passionate about Jesus. I want my life to be marked by healthy relationships. I, I want my, my life to be, to be marked by that spring up a well. I want rivers of life flowing out of me thirst after Jesus you also got to turn off other fountains you got to turn off other fountains here's what I mean we settle for the crumbs of the world rather than the juicy steak of God's word right we settle for lesser things rather than than the gospel Ephesians chapter 4 verses 30 and 31 says this do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Another place says, do not quench the Holy Spirit of God. And then he says, how do you grieve the Holy Spirit of God? The next verse says, then uh, if you're not going to grieve it, let all bitterness, let all clamor, let all wrath and anger, uh, slander and malice, let all of that be put away from you. Our relationships and the way that we treat others a lot of times is the way we quench and grieve the Spirit. We sin. And it grieves the power and the presence and, and this feeling and this rivers of life flowing out of us as we do that. You see, we're, we're leaky buckets. We're leaky buckets. And a lot of times we go to a fountain that is um, diluted, a well that's diluted. When we say, I'm going to do my own thing rather than follow Christ. We go to a well that's diluted and say, I'm not going to submit and receive God's word and, and what it says about sexual ethic, what it says about relationships with each other, what it says about whatever. Instead, I'm going to drink uh, from a diluted well of the world. It says we quench the Holy Spirit as we reject the word of God instead of receiving the word of God. Thirst after Jesus. Turn off other fountains. How do you turn off other fountains? Well, you repent. Repentance involves three things, confession, contrition, and change. Confession is where we agree with God that we are sinners. You're not surprising God. He already knows. You're agreeing with him. Confession is a good thing for you. We agree with God. Contrition, sorrow in our hearts that we have drank from a, a dirty cistern, from a diluted well instead of the fountains of the, of the living God. We have sorrow in our hearts because we did that. And then change. We walk a new way. And the power of the Spirit. Thirst after Jesus, turn off fountains and pray for it. This is crazy verse in Luke. Luke chapter 11, talking about prayer. And um, it's this illustration like if, if you as a parent know how to give a good gift to your kid, how much more do you think God the Father knows how to give a good gift to your kid? And then he, and then he like turns it. And we don't get a beamer and we don't give more money and stuff like that. But here's what he says the good gift is in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You want to be filled with the Spirit? Pray. You see, the 30-year pattern of the books of Act, book of Acts is prayer, then breakthrough. Prayer, then the filling of the Spirit. If I would have read to you the verses that came after Acts 1, uh, 1 through 11. After that, the disciples, they gather in the upper room. And for 10 days, it says the main thing that they did for 10 days, they did a few other things, but the main thing they did for 10 days, there's 120 of them in the room, they prayed. They prayed for 10 days, then the Spirit came. They gathered, they prayed for 10 days, the Spirit came. Peter stood up and preached. At best, what I can tell was a 10-minute sermon, and 3,000 people were saved. And so, listen, prayer, breakthrough. Prayer, the Spirit. Now, now we flip it, preach for 10 days, strategize for 10 days, pray for 10 minutes, and we see one or two conversions, right? But they prayed for 10 days, preached for 10 minutes, and the world was changed. Acts chapter 4, prayer, then breakthrough. They prayed, they prayed, and then... God shook them, it says, filled them with the Spirit, shook the place, and they went and shook the world. Over and over again, you see it. The 30-year pattern, because the book of Acts is about 30 years, a little more, give or take. 
about 30 years over and over again, the book of Acts, that movement where the gospel extended across the globe and across, you know, not across the globe, across their entire area. Um, it was prayer, then breakthrough. Prayer, then filling of the Spirit. We pray. We pray. Nothing brings the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life or in a church like prayer. Prayer. Just simple getting on your knees, praying together as a church. Prayer. How's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Then if you want to be filled, last thing, you got to seek the Holy Spirit and his word. Remember back to where I started. Will we receive the word? You see, the word and the spirit go together. First, first Peter chapter 1 uh, says this. We have something uh, more sure. We have the prophetic word to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, the morning star rises in your heart. Great, beautiful language. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. Flip forward a few verses. Yep. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit breathed out the Word of God. If you want more of the Spirit, we thirst after Jesus, the gospel. We need more gospel. We thirst after Jesus. We turn off the broken and the deluded wells that we've been running to. We turn them off. We pray, God, empower us for ministry. Empower us to see disciples made. We listen, right? And we seek his word. We seek his word. Because then his word is is the spirit breathed will of God. More spirit, more word. More spirit, get in the book. Are you aware of the power and the presence of the spirit in your life? Do you want more? Do you want rivers of life flowing out of you? You know, 2016, for you, it might have been routine. Same old, same old. 2016 might have ended badly, hopefully not as bad as Mariah Carey's ended, but it might have ended rough, right? Do you want rivers of life flowing out of you? There's new mercy, there's new grace, there's new hope for you and for me and for all of us in 2017. There's more spirit empowerment for us in 2017 if we receive it, if we repent, if we obey, obey. How do we know if we're obeying the spirit? We'll be witnesses here up the road to the ends of the earth.